Our second lesson this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Hear now the word of the Lord. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, I pray now that you would pour your Holy Spirit through me, that these words might truly become your living word to your people. And I pray that you would open up each of our hearts and minds that we might receive that word exactly in the place that we need to hear it. For we pray this in the name of our risen and reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Be careful how you live, Paul says. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Wisdom, I believe, is a lost virtue in our culture. When's the last time you ever heard a child say that they wanted to grow up to be wise? We just value so many other things more than wisdom, intelligence, knowledge, success, athleticism, attractiveness, wealth, power, influence, social media followers. But what exactly does it mean to be wise? I mean, certainly it seems to imply discernment and judgment of some sort. One dictionary defines it as great understanding of people and circumstances and unusual discernment and judgment in dealing with them. But how does one become wise as a Christian? Well, I believe that in our text this morning, the Apostle Paul is giving us the key, the pathway to wisdom in the Christian life is gratitude, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I'm not sure if there's a way to measure someone's spiritual stature, but if there is one, it's probably gratitude. Gratitude reveals just how much we understand of the, the blessings and the grace that we have received from God. And I believe that learning to be grateful accomplishes more for Christian maturity than perhaps any other activity or attitude. It gives us lenses to better perceive the work of God in our lives, which increases our strength, our, our faith, and our trust in God. This is how we make the most of the time. For as we become more aware of what God is doing in our lives, as we learn to pay attention to God's presence and activity among us, the world around us becomes a different place, a place of wonder of possibilities, a place of hope, even a place of miracles. This is why our family always says grace, a prayer of thanksgiving before every meal. We are teaching our kids that this food, which may or may not appear very appetizing to them, is a gift from God which they did not deserve so that they might learn to become thankful in all things. 
After all, gratitude, a grateful heart, is not something that happens on its own. It must be cultivated. Because let's be honest, it is not always easy to be thankful. I mean, this life is not always a bed of roses, right? I mean, all of us go through hard times in life, whether because of illness or accident or grief or disappointment, where it's just really hard for us to find something for which to be thankful. I mean, there's a lot of bad things that happen to us in life, right? I mean, does Paul really expect us to be thankful for all those things? I mean, doesn't he know how the world is? Well, I actually think it's precisely because Paul knows how the world is, that the days are evil, that he says these things. Remember, Paul suffered enormously in his own life, more than most of us could ever imagine. And Paul knows that learning to be grateful is often the only way for us to endure such trials without having to, to numb the pain with alcohol or or some other addiction. The gratitude is, is God's gift to us, God's way of helping us get through to the other side and transforming the journey along the way. In her wonderful book, The Hiding Place, Dutch Christian Corrie ten Boom tells how her family hid Jews in their home during the Nazi occupation of Holland in World War II. After being arrested, Corey and her sister Betsy ended up in Ravensbrück, a notorious women's concentration camp where they were put to hard labor. Amazingly, despite multiple checkpoints, they were able to sneak a Bible into their dormitory, which was overcrowded with so many starving, thirsty, exhausted women from all over Europe. But mysteriously, despite rigid surveillance everywhere else, their Bible, the, 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 the guards never came near their dorm room, and therefore the Bible was never discovered. And so they were able to continue their Bible studies freely because those crowded conditions allowed all these women to gather closely around the sisters every night and hear the words of life, words that transformed their prison. Now, when they, they first arrived in Ravensbrook into their reeking overcrowded conditions, the first thing that the sisters discovered was that the place was crawling with fleas. How could anyone live in such a place? Corey cried out. Well, Betsy immediately began to pray that God would show them how. Suddenly, Betsy cried out that God had already given them the answer that morning in Scripture. So Corey opened up to the passage they had been studying earlier that day, and she read aloud. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So despite Corey's skepticism, Betsy immediately be giving thanks for all the things in their dormitory, and reluctantly, Corey joined in. They gave thanks that the two of them were there together and hadn't been separated. They gave thanks that they still had their Bibles, and for all the women there who would who would meet God through its pages. They even gave thanks for their overcrowded conditions, which allowed more women to hear. But then Betsy went too far. Thank you, she said, for the fleas. Oh, this was just too much for Corey. I mean, not even God himself could possibly ever make her grateful for a flea. Give thanks in all circumstances, Betsy quoted. It doesn't say in pleasant circumstances. And so, they gave thanks for the fleas. But this time, Corey was certain that her sister was wrong. 
But then one evening, after Cora had been out gathering wood, she returned to her dorm room to find her sister looking rather pleased with herself. They had always wondered why they'd had so much freedom in their dorm room, which allowed them to carry out their Bible studies and their worship services without being disturbed. Well, Betsy had discovered why. See, she had overheard one of the guards talking, saying that none of them would ever come into their dorm room because the place was crawling with fleas. And suddenly, Corey remembered back to that moment when Betsy had first given thanks to God for those fleas. You know, so often in our lives, God is at work for our good in and through the very things that, that trouble us, that, that challenge us, that confuse us, that, that pain us, that even cause us to question God's goodness. But we're not always able to see it at the time. In his book, The Dark Night of the Soul, Gerald May writes, I must confess that I'm not always very good anymore at distinguishing between the good things and the bad things. Of course, there are some events in human history that can only be labeled as evil, but from the standpoint of inner individual experience, the distinction has become blurred for me. Some things start off looking great but wind up terribly, while other things seem bad in the beginning but turn out to be blessings in disguise. Now, certainly, we all have fleas of one sort or another in our lives, things or people or circumstances that cause us such grief, and we can't ever imagine how those things could possibly turn out to be blessings in disguise. What are some of the names of the fleas in your life? Mine go by many names. And I have a hard time finding a way to be thankful for those things the way that Betsy was thankful for the fleas. As Corey discovered, it is not always easy giving thanks at all times and for everything. And yet, this is what Paul urges us to do because it is God's will for our lives that we all work at becoming people of gratitude. You see, we don't start trying to be grateful when hard times arrive, arise. That's like trying to run a marathon without training. No, we practice being thankful every day so that when hard times do arise, we are able to get through them. Because it is through a spirit of thanksgiving that the Holy Spirit often works in our lives. Betsy de Tin Boom did not suddenly become a grateful person when she was put into prison. She had, learned, she had been learning to be one her whole life through her faith and her love of Scripture. And when the face of evil rose up before her, the Holy Spirit rose up even greater through her thankful heart. And Betsy marveled that God could be present and sovereign even in a place like Ravensbrook. And if we, too, want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and experience the transforming power of God in our lives, then we must also cultivate grateful hearts, especially because the days are evil. I mean, it's not hard to see the truth in Paul's words, is it? I mean, just watch the news for five minutes and it will become abundantly clear. I mean, from the wars going on in Ukraine and Sudan 
to the incredibly frequent gun violence in our own country that no one seems to want to do anything about, to the, the number of children who go to bed hungry every night, even right here in our own city of Birmingham, to the ugliness and the unkindness and the hate that has become the norm in our society when we don't all agree. The days certainly are evil. So does Paul really expect us to be grateful for all these things? Are we supposed to give thanks to God for violence and hunger and hate and tragedy? I don't know. Like Gerald May, I must confess that I do not always have the wisdom to discern and distinguish between the things for which we should and should not give thanks. What I do know, however, as Corey Ten Boom discovered, is that there is never a time or a place where we cannot find something for which to be grateful, even in the midst of pain and suffering and tragedy. After all, we are a people who have stood at the cross of Jesus Christ and witnessed the worst that evil can do. And yet we have also been to the empty tomb and discovered that what appeared to be evil's victory was actually sin's greatest. What, sin, what appeared to be the triumph of evil was actually love's greatest victory. Easter morning is our assurance that despite what appears to be going on around us, God is not finished yet. And therefore our, our thankfulness is not a naive denial of the evil in this world or all that is going wrong. Rather, it is an act of faith that God is present and sovereign and at work in all things for the good of those who love him. And for the things that appear to be fleas in our lives, whether they be small or good, we give thanks now in hope that a day will come when we are able to do so as witnesses of the good that God has brought about. You know, I'm, I'm sure that there are some things in our lives that we may never see how God was at work or, or any good that came out of it. But again, we, we give thanks in faith and in trust that, that one day in the kingdom, we will see clearly what now we only see in a mirror dimly. Regardless, we give thanks in good times and in bad times because we believe that God is sovereign and that not even our pain and our disappointment is beyond the reach of God or God's ability to transform even the darkest of nights into the brightness of Easter morning. For what the cross teaches us is that, that God can use even the worst of things and use them for good. Just as God used overcrowded, flea-ridden conditions in a concentration camp to give life to so many women. But it takes the wisdom of a life of gratitude to be able to see that. This is why we continue to gather together each week for worship. For here we come to practice giving thanks to God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit 
to, to sing and make melody in our hearts as we shout, praise God from whom all blessings flow. We are shaping our minds and orienting our lives toward the source of all good. And I believe that it is God's will for each of us that regardless of what is going on in our lives or under which conditions we find ourselves, that we are to focus our attention with gratitude on the God who is above all circumstances, the God who is present and reigning, even in concentration camps, even in our own pain and disappointment. And as we learn to place our lives gratefully into God's hands, giving thanks at all times and for everything, knowing that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and trusting that in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, then maybe, just maybe, one day, we will even be wise enough to say, thank God for the fleas. <laughs>